So uh, bonjour everyone. Uh, I'm here with uh, Stuart Wheeler, who is our Canada's chief of protocol and a friend of mine for, well, we won't say quite how many years, uh, since the mid nineties when we both joined uh, what was then foreign affairs. And uh, since then, Stuart has had a very distinguished career. He's had uh, postings in Washington, London, Bogota, um, and uh, the one that I am extremely jealous of, of course, is the one as ambassador to Iceland, the land of my ancestors from uh, 2012 to, uh, to 2016. He's also been the uh, chief of protocol for Ontario. Um, and since uh, 2019, January 2019, have, have I got that right? He has been uh, chief of protocol for Canada, where he has, uh, you know, immediately or almost immediately had to deal with the pandemic and the COVID situation. And um, it has been doing some very creative networking. So I have asked him to, to join us. Before we start, I would just like to acknowledge that um, we are, I'm hosting this meeting from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And we acknowledge them as the, the past, present and future caretakers of this land. And also um, as is our tradition and the sad tradition, it's starting to grow into quite one since we've been doing it for quite a while. Just would like to remind everybody to spare a thought for our friend and colleague, Michael Kovrig and uh, fellow Canadian Michael Spavor, who are now marking 883 days um, in uh, what we see unjust detention in, in China. And we hope that um, things will change and that they will, they will be able to come home soon. So without further ado, I will turn over to, to Stuart and ask him to speak to you. Stuart, I think if you're gonna do most of your, your uh, chat to us in English, but um, you're okay taking, uh, taking questions in French, I understand? Bien sûr. Okay, merci beaucoup. Allons-y. <laughs> Ok, ben merci beaucoup euh, Pam, euh, bonjour tout le monde, euh, euh, je suis ravi d'être là avec vous ce matin, euh, même si en, en virtuel, uh, thank you very much Pam. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, it, it's funny, when, you, when, you're, when, you're, um, uh, when you're, you're used to doing events all, all, all the time, I think that all of us are in our diplomatic lives, someone invites you to a breakfast, you're thinking, oh, wow, this is going to be cool, I haven't been invited to one of those for a while. Um, and then you realize, well, no, I've got to bring my own breakfast, I guess. And what it really means, is I just have to get up earlier. Anyway, uh, I'm very pleased to be here nonetheless, and I brought my coffee, so I'll, uh, I'll pause from time to time. Um, Pam uh, asked me to talk a little bit about, uh, about what we've been doing in, in protocol uh, to stay connected with the diplomatic community during the pandemic. Um, uh, and then hopefully we, we, we can have some time for conversation because I think, uh, I think there's some really interesting uh, topics that are coming out of the, the pandemic and coming out of how people are adjusting uh, diplomacy uh, to the virtual world. Um, Uh, that would be really interesting and important to talk about. Uh, ce que nous avons tous uh, vécu cette dernière année, uh, ça va nous manquer pendant des, uh, des, des années, bon, pendant beau, longtemps, je pense, um, du point de vue personnel, uh, j'en suis certain, uh, mais aussi uh, dans la manière que nous travaillons, uh, que nous entreprenons prenons la, la diplomatie aussi. Um, so going back to, uh, to I guess, uh, you know, a little bit over a year ago, um, I think uh, like many, uh, so many organizations around the world uh, and all of you, uh, wherever you're located, uh, at mission or at, at headquarters, uh, the work of the, the Office of Protocol was, was significantly affected by the, the pandemic. Um, you know, overnight official travel uh, by VVIPs uh, was grounded, high level visits were canceled, ceremonies, events were postponed. Um, but at the same time, uh, there was this increased need uh, for stakeholder engagement. And uh, certainly in terms of clear and consistent communication with the diplomatic corps uh, here in Ottawa and across Canada, um, in order to continue fulfilling and, and, and offering the range of, of, of services that we uh, offer to them in, in the Office of Protocol, accreditation, agreement, privileges and immunities, diplomatic security, uh, all sorts of things that, that happen behind the scenes, the kind of the plumbing of diplomacy. Um, uh, but it all, of course, had to be done in new ways. And just like you uh, adapting our processes and, and our work to be done online, over the telephone, virtual method, me methods. Um, and I got to admit, uh, 
at the beginning, I was I was a little worried um, about the future of the protocol role. Um, you know, the the the, the questions uh, you know going through my mind were about about how long was this going to last. Um, you know, we have a we have a fairly um, a type uh, proactive energetic uh, group of people that work in protocol um, who are really excited to to put on events and and, and host visits and uh, uh, and if we weren't going to be doing that what were we going to be doing to uh, to keep these people uh, stimulated and motivated and um, uh, and interested if this was going to last not just a couple of months but 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 maybe six months maybe a year maybe 18 months and, and I think we've all sort of gone through those ups and downs over the past uh, those pa this past year um but um as, as the world of diplomacy moved online and found all sorts of new ways to engage it became clear to me really that the pro the role of protocol expertise and and experienced event management if you will um was going to be more important than ever um au début j'assistais à beaucoup de réunions um où uh, où j'écoutais des, des des comptes rendus de réunions ou engagements virtuels qui, qui, que nos ministres faisaient, faisaient dans le temps. Et, et il y avait beaucoup de fois que les gens disaient qu'il y avait eu des problèmes avec la technologie, ce qui était total, totalement normal. C'était du jamais vu. Mais, euh, mais aussi des problèmes avec les, les interlocuteurs qui n'avaient pas le, les bonnes instructions, qui n'avaient pas le bon, le bon lien, que, euh, que leur logiciel ne fonctionnait pas, euh, qui ont manqué le moment pour faire le lien à cause des fuseaux horaires. Euh, qui n'avait pas la chance de euh, eu la chance de se bien se préparer. Uh, you know, there was all all sorts of uh, of of hiccups that were happening in, in these early days of of moving diplomacy online. And and I remember sitting at a uh, at some meeting, uh, you know, um, and I think I was texting with somebody on the side of the meeting, uh, starting to think that you know these are these are solvable problems. These are these are um, in a way, uh, they're the kind of problems, uh, if you put them in an in-person uh, environment, that a protocol officer would be solving in advance of a, pro uh, of a meeting. Um, you know, when, uh, when people ask about what protocol does uh, or what protocol officers do, it's often, my answer is often that we, we set the table, we make sure everything's ready, we, uh, we're, we're behind the scenes so that everything happens uh, uh, correctly uh, and uh, and smoothly in in front of the scenes um, you know and the best uh, the best uh, achievement protocol can happen or can have is 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 if we disappear into the background and nobody knows that protocol even you know waved its magic wand to to to, to fix the, uh, the you know the 17 uh, issues and hiccups that came up along the way um, so you know that that job of working with organizers or in this case in the virtual world participants often um, divisions ministers offices, uh, international counterparts, to ensure that everything's set up properly and everybody's participating and has what they need and is positioned for success. That, that, that was kind of the, the role that I, uh, I, you know, I put up my hand and, and my colleague, the director general at the time of the summit's management office, put up his hand and said, listen, we, uh, we have people uh, who, who, who uh, know how to do this stuff um, and can, can help. Um, uh, but it also became very clear uh, that moving diplomacy online wasn't a, a simple task uh, of, you know, that in some, some ways the organization of online and virtual events um, would take similar or even more uh, work by by very dedicated teams, and so from that um, from that conversation, those conversations emerged the mandate that the deputy ministers then gave uh, to the summits management office and protocol uh, to coordinate and support all of the multilateral and bilateral virtual events undertaken by all three of our uh, GAC portfolio, uh, portfolio ministers and the DMs, um, and and. And just to, to put that in, in, into perspective, over the last year, then we have coordinated and delivered in one way or another over 480 multilateral and bilateral meetings online. Um, so, so in some ways, uh, the protocol and visits teams and the summit management office uh, have had one of the busiest years uh, uh, that we've ever had on record. Um, But at the same time, uh, the diplomatic core services team uh, in, in protocol was was also working overtime, uh, engaging with the foreign diplomatic core in Canada. That's uh, over 8,000 people, uh, uh, that community is 8,000 people strong across the country, um, dans plus de, de 400 uh, bureaux consulaires et diplomatiques uh, dans plusieurs villes à travers et, et provinces à travers le pays. 
Um, so not long after, uh, you know, we were all working from home, we're, we're holding virtual town hall meetings and info sessions to reach out to the to, to diplomats, you know, people are moving video meetings onto video and conference calls. Uh, it also became clear to me um, that all that virtual work really wasn't going to replace uh, the kind of one-on-one -on -one in person interaction that's uh, that's often at the core of, of what we do in diplomacy. Um, so, so that kind of engagement um, uh, was really important. Um, I, you know, I don't want to get philosophical about it, but it kind of reminded me that the the, the relationships that we build um, and we nurture through protocol, through diplomatic work, as I say, are all personal relationships. And indeed, you know, the, the what we do with with hospitality, what we do with uh, engagement, both overseas and at home, is uh, is create relationships so that so that we can then move professional things down the uh, down the field, so we can um, so so that we know we've got uh, um, um, you know someone who will listen to us when we want to raise an issue. Um, it's that, it's that um, uh, kind of very difficult to, to describe uh, value uh, of, of in-person diplomacy or, or person-to-person -person diplomacy. Um, and in my role as chief of protocol uh, here in Ottawa, it's almost like I'm a member of the diplomatic corps uh, that's based here. In a way, uh, I serve as the as the ambassador to the ambassadors. Um, uh, so, so I kind of realized that I needed to do um, what so many people were doing with their own friends and neighbors, what we were all doing with our family members and our uh, um, uh, and our loved ones um, during COVID, and I, so I, I needed to reach out personally. Um, I needed to make sure that uh, that that my diplomatic friends were okay. Um, that it didn't need to be about uh, about work. It needed to be about making sure that they had what they needed to per persevere. Like many of you who are on post. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of sunk in that they are here in Canada. And while they're, in many cases, they're probably lucky that they were in Canada during this time. Um, you know, I think we've we've uh, handled the, the the pandemic pretty well by and large. Um, uh, but those people were also separated from their families. Those people were also unable to travel, unable to go home uh, um, necessarily, and, uh, and and trying to, like we were um, at a distance, uh, take care of, uh, uh, of of their loved ones or worried about them. Um, so. Last year, uh, you know, we were all in lockdown at the very start, um, trying to do our daily walks. Of course, at the start, we were all trying to learn learn a new language or make bread. That ended very quickly, I think. Um, but uh, but as the uh, as the weather improved, uh, I uh, I kind of got got bored of my my walk around my immediate block or neighborhood for exercise. So I jumped on my bicycle um, and started kind of doing house calls, um, kind of like an old fashioned country doctor. I, uh, it was my version of bicycle diplomacy. I, I you know, it wasn't about uh, in-depth formal meetings. It was about stopping by and, and knocking on people's doors, uh, trying to make a human connection and, and seeing how they're doing. Um, and, and, you know, and, and it really, um, it was really, appreciated um uh you know the the um just just being able to hear you know people uh i think when 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 uh and people are here as ambassadors um uh, you know they they um they're very uh keen to have contact with uh with with us with people at foreign affairs uh with their their geo and functional counterparts um but they don't want to impose they uh you know if they're having problems at home or if they're having problems with their kids that are homeschooling now they're not going to reach out to to to, to us to, 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 to talk about those things. And, um, and often when you're the head of mission uh, at a post, you always also don't, uh, you find yourself in a situation where you don't necessarily want to share your own uh, anxieties and, uh, and problems with your own team either. Um, so uh, it kind of took off from there. Uh, I started tweeting about it on social media and other chiefs of protocol started doing the same internationally, particularly my Dutch counterpart, uh, of course, of good bicycling uh, uh, stock. She was uh, out uh, biking and, and visiting the Canadian ambassador and other ambassadors all around The Hague. Um, uh, so it just, for me, it, it's, it struck me that, that, you know, in, in, in a time of crisis, we need to, we need to be creative. And I think people were, were doing that in many ways, uh, to take care of their teams, uh, and, their, uh, um, uh, and in a way I, I just kind of expanded that, uh, that circle to include, uh, include the diplomats, um, here in Ottawa. Um. After the second wave in the fall, once winter had arrived, uh, uh, 
I, I, I wanted to continue doing it. Um, uh, I like winter, so I, uh, I was keen to get out and, and embrace winter. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that, that, that ambassadors that were uh, that were not as uh, used to winter um, uh, would realize that it's uh, it's not so scary. Um, you know, in Iceland, uh, they say that uh, there's no such thing as bad weather, uh, only bad bad wardrobe planning. Uh, so uh, so I uh, I would uh, I would uh, meet up with one or two ambassadors a week, and um, uh, we would uh, you know separately, um, making sure that everything was done uh, you know safely. Uh, we would meet at uh, Bridgehead Coffee on on Spark Street, grab a coffee, uh, and then go for a walk down the canal. Uh, and as long as you're well dressed, uh, it was uh, it was a great way to uh, to connect with people, get some exercise, get some sun shine uh, keep and keep my finger on the pulse uh, of the dip core at the same time um, one of uh, when it comes to the the kind of the events that we do and how we uh, how we adapted them um, you know the the uh, I mentioned that the, the team, uh, um, our, our team in protocol is um, is not only pretty proactive and, and energetic, but they're creative and they're they were really excited to kind of turn their uh, their heads to how do we adapt, how do we take the the things that we do and move them online, um, and. And so some of the stuff we 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 looked at what is our uh, head of mission outreach program and and what what do we do um, for diplomatic outreach and how can we uh, how can we adjust that as we move it online? So for example, one of the one of the I think one of the nicest things we do as a foreign ministry is to offer uh, a formal farewell lunch uh, for departing ambassadors um, when they're ending long time postings in Canada. Um, uh, but of course, with no in-person events, uh, that wasn't going to happen. Um, but I felt like it, it would it would really be a missed opportunity if we just kind of dropped that and you know said said goodbye on the phone and uh, you know and or sent them an email and, and and had them leave the country without without being able to pause and uh, um, and really cement that relationship because often when I when we do those those farewell lunches what you realize is we're investing in cementing these people to be ambassadors of Canada in a way when they go back to their countries or on to other postings so I thought it was important that we not kind of abandon that tradition of honoring the relationship um, that had been built and and expressing thanks uh, for their their uh, their collaboration um, so uh, so we need to develop a new uh, a new way of doing that um, so uh, I challenged the team to, to think through what is what is a, a farewell lunch really all about uh, and how could we do uh, do it safely um, so they thought through the various uh, objectives of a farewell lunch uh, and for each objective uh, they came up with a, a feasible safe alternative way for achieving it um, so what we have now are, are called farewell uh, or virtual farewell tea uh, event or coffee event um, uh, and uh, you know what what does a, a farewell lunch do it uh, it provides an engagement uh, at senior levels so we do a separate vip virtual tete-a-tete -tete with a deputy minister or an adm uh, prior to the main event event uh, what you know at a, at a lunch normally you'd be bringing together um, cherished colleagues to uh, to bid farewell uh, so we do that uh, virtually in a larger group um, where people can can can, uh, can each take the the floor and, uh, and say a few words um, uh, a farewell lunch is an opportunity to, to extend some Canadian hospitality um, so we uh, we have the, the chefs from from uh, from the ninth floor to uh, De, uh, develop or or, or um, make uh, boxes of, uh, uh, of pastries uh, that we share, uh, that we deliver, uh, or have uh, have the ambassador send their their, their drivers to pick up uh, at our building. Um, so that's a bit uh, more safely uh, safely delivered. Um, so they get a chef prepared box of pastries, um, and of course we uh, we also uh, take the opportunity to give uh, the parting ambassador uh, a gift, um, which we we've chosen uh, that our the gift that we give is a small um, Inuit uh, uh, Inukshuk uh, in soapstone um, uh, <clears throat> and it gives us a chance to talk uh, a little bit about uh, about the symbolism and and, and about uh, about that as a lasting uh, memory for Canada uh, for them so for, for us it was really an opportunity uh, for the team to be creative uh, to, to re-examine what the actual objectives are uh, and then go back to basics and reimagine how we could do do those things and achieve our goals um, I think it was pretty successful um, uh, the ambassadors love it uh, they love the fact that they're even uh, being invited to something and, and coming together um, even if it is virtual 
Um, so we went, uh, we went a little further. Uh, we have two big, huge events uh, each year uh, that are typically uh, um, receptions for, for, for two, two to three, 400 people. Uh, Canada Day, we usually do that to watch the fireworks on, uh, from the ninth floor. Uh, of course, we couldn't do that uh, uh, this year or last year, and I don't think we're doing it this year. So last year, we sent uh, all of the ambassadors and high commissioners an electronic package of resources so they could create their own uh, backyard celebration of Canada Day, um, complete with uh, Canadian food and drink recipes uh, from our chef, uh, links to special Canada Day entertainment. Uh, the team uh, scoured uh, um, uh, online and, and found all sorts of uh, cool ideas for, for celebrating Canada Day um, uh, the way Canadians would be um, at home in their own backyards, uh, uh, because that's where we were in, in, the, in the pandemic. Um, in December, December we usually do a big uh, holiday reception uh, at the NAC or, or or at the Museum of History or Parliament. Um, uh, again, uh, you know, with the minister, with the PM, we couldn't do that. So this year, we 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 essentially broadcast uh, a YouTube live uh, event uh, to them um, with uh, video messages from the ministers, from, from Senator Beam, from, uh, from the Prime Minister. Uh, we had uh, Inuit uh, musical performances. Uh, we even uh, raffled a door prize of, of Canadian goodies and, and had that delivered. Uh, and uh, very popular, um, we had our chefs get busy uh, and uh, they made uh, chocolate Yule logs, uh, cakes uh, and shortbread cookies uh, and all um, over a hundred uh, ambassadors and high commissioners sent their drivers to the building to pick those up uh, so they could share in, uh, in a little bit of, uh, of seasonal, seasonal festivities with us. Um, and then uh, probably the, the the last thing I'd mention is, is probably one of the most innovative events that we that we developed uh, because this was really one where it wasn't us adapting an event that we already do, but but recognizing a need and then sort of kind of um, stepping up and figuring out how we could help. Um, uh, so. Moi, je, je me suis rendu compte euh, euh, que les nou nouveaux ambassadeurs, les ambassadeurs qui, qui arrivent euh, au Canada, euh, moi, j'ai la, 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 le privilège d'être le premier, per la, le premier, la première personne normalement que, avec qui ils ont une réunion, elles ont une réunion. Euh, alors, je, je, je crée déjà une relation avec eux euh, dès le début. Um, and one of the things that I, I realized from these early first uh, encounters with uh, with arriving heads of mission, the, the 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 heads of mission that arrived during the pandemic, uh, we had about um, we had about. Uh, uh, 15 or so in in uh, uh, in 2020, and we've had an, um, another uh, 15 or, or 20 arrive this year. Um, uh, they, they, I mean, they they all presented their credentials uh, virtually, uh, either to the governor general uh, or to the administrator. Um, they they've never experienced the Ottawa diplomatic social circuit. Uh, you know, one of the things that I tell uh, them in our, in our first meetings, when I, when I, when I meet them in person or, um, uh, or during the pandemic, if I meet them on the phone uh, is I, I usually part of my spiel is to tell them how, how uh, vibrant and, um, and active the Ottawa uh, scene is the social scene in terms of, uh, of uh, events and um, uh, conferences and activities that the universities put on and the think tanks and private sector and uh, national days uh, you know there's there's a constant stream of activities that they'll be able to get out and meet people um, <clears throat> meet their colleagues but of course uh, that can't happen or that wasn't happening isn't happening uh, during the pandemic um, so it kind of dawned on me that that these people were really going to have a hard time doing what I think is kind of a core thing of what we do in diplomacy and that's build our networks um, uh, you know we um, we, we, uh, we, I think we spend a lot of time, in the, especially at the start of a, a, of a posting, um, establishing our network, getting out there, um, uh, and it's a lot easier to do in a, in a social environment where you can walk up to somebody, introduce yourself, and, 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 and you know, give the kind of um, elevator pitch of, uh, of what, you, what, what you're about and where you, where you come from and what you do. Um, but if you're sitting at home and you're under lockdown, and the only way you can connect with people is by asking for uh, a photo a, a phone call or a teams meeting or uh, or, or something on webex or something um, and, and then it becomes a cold call situation um, that's a lot more uh, challenging um, so uh, so with that as a backdrop I uh, 
we decided, uh, you know, that we could we could um, help them. Um, uh, I think we were uh, the idea came to me. I was I was uh, uh, I was thinking about um, the engagement that the that uh, that the um, the uh, uh, <clears throat> Women's Network does uh, organizes the annual uh, speed mentoring uh, uh, event where where uh, and some of the ambassadors that, uh, that that are involved in that as well. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I sort of thought, well, why don't we do diplomatic speed networking, uh, almost like speed dating? Um, you know, I've I've had the privilege of of being on that same social circuit, so I see I know the people that they would be running into um, uh, if they were at the same uh, Chateau Laurier uh, National Day receptions that I that I uh, you know was going to on a regular basis. Um, so I reached out after Christmas to a bunch of uh, of leaders from um, from a variety of organizations, institutions around town, uh, the rectors of the universities, heads of think tanks, cultural institutions, private sector leaders, trade associations. Um, and invited them to come uh, uh, along uh, a few at a time uh, and meet these new ambassadors. Um, so we uh, we launched uh, this 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 series called Diplomatic Speed Networking, Le Réseautage Express. Um, uh, and again, it was a chance to get our, uh, our 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 hospitality team on the ninth floor thinking about it. So they uh, came up with a, a series of uh, savory canapes that uh, that they could little boucher that they could uh, put together in a, snacks in a little box. Um, we uh, we sent the ambassadors at the start of the series uh, uh, a bottle of Canadian wine from our cellar, uh, and then a list of uh, of of, of uh, recommendations from our sommelier, so they could buy uh, wine for the for, or or uh, whatever drink they wanted for the for the future ones, and and really set it up like it was a reception. Um, uh, the uh, uh, we use the magic of, of WebEx breakout groups uh, to uh, to move small groups of ambassadors around automatically from special guest to special guest. Uh, we have three uh, special guests at a time, uh, and it's really not about you know in-depth presentations uh, or long speeches. It's about it's about the you know uh, recreating that moment where you you know you you come up to a, a cruiser table at a reception um, and you've got a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and your organization uh, to this group of new ambassadors that happen to be uh, that, that that you've met there um, and and the special guests that we've we've invited have loved it um, uh, they it turns out they do do a lot of work uh, with uh, ambassadors they're not on the diplomatic social circuit um, just to have uh, another uh, round of, of of popcorn shrimp at the the Chateau Laurier, they're uh, they're there uh, because they too want to get in touch with uh, with with uh, these uh, representatives from all around the world, and uh, and so giving them the opportunity to connect with new ones uh, has been really has been really great, and we've seen lots of you know sparks of ideas fly and, and follow up and collaboration happening, so that that's been really rewarding. Um, cette semaine, on fera notre uh, neuvième uh, événement dans, dans, on, on est déjà dans la deuxième série. Um, Alors, on, on, on aura présenté euh, une trentaine de chefs de file de plus de, de 25 euh, nous, euh, à, à, à plus de 25 nouveaux chefs de mission euh, qui sont sinon euh, sont assez handicapés dans leurs efforts euh, de faire ces connexions. Alors, euh, euh, ça, ça, ça me fait chaud au cœur un, un peu d'avoir de, de, pu euh, aider un peu euh, dans, 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 cette, euh, dans cet égard aussi. Um, so looking back, I mean, it's certainly not been a typical year uh, for us, for sure. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk to somebody they haven't spoken to for a long time, and they'll say, "Wow, protocol! You guys must have had a, a quiet year." Um, but uh, I got to say, it's not been an idle year at all. Um, uh, and and of course, in addition to all of that, we had lots of people on our team put up their hands and and volunteer in in, in different pressure points all around the department. So it's been a it, it's actually been a, a a busy and tough year for for a lot of the people on the team. But it's really been I think rewarding uh, in in being able to flex our creativity. Um, why don't I stop there? Uh, I've talked for too long. I hate uh, sort of talking into a into microphone and not really knowing if whether you're you're all still there anymore, uh, <laughs> whether you've tuned out, uh, <laughs> gone to sleep. Um, but uh, I really would be interested to hear um, uh, not only if you, of course, if you have any questions, but um, but I know there's some folks on the call uh, on the call from our missions. Uh, I'd love to hear about what your host countries uh, have been doing to adapt uh, diplomacy where you are. 
um, things that you've seen from uh, from from other missions uh, or from other countries would be would be interesting. Um, but I'd also like to hear what 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 people think in general uh, about the future of diplomacy uh, and how some of the things that that you know might might change going forward uh, as we return to the to the, the world of in person. Um, but uh, having kind of experimented with the tools of diplomacy during this year and you know what what parts of that do we take with us and how does it change our work habits and our uh, our travel habits and uh, and our engagement habits uh, because I think that's gonna that's gonna change uh, the nature of diplomacy for a while. So over oh. to you Pam. Thanks, Stuart. No, that's really that. That's exactly what I was hoping for from you to talk talk about these kinds of things. I'm struck by a couple of things that you talk about. Number one, it, like the, the importance of food. <laughs> you know, food and uh, and uh, wine and and coffee to to create rapport. So I hope that this is something that that we take forward when we go back to normal to remind everybody. You know. I mean, there's actual neuroscience, right, about the, the, the reason that we do so many things with hospitality. You know, I remember on my first posting in Nairobi, I went gorilla watching one, one time in Rwanda. And one of the things they said to us was, if a gorilla comes up to you and looks aggressive, the thing to do is grab a leaf from one of the trees, pretend to eat it, and then offer some to the gorilla. And that signals to the primate brain that, you know, you're not there to fight. You're there to hang out and relax and, and you know, to make friends. And I think that we primates have that with each other, you know? So it's, uh, I'm glad to hear that you guys have found creative ways of having, and having that shared experience with, with people where everyone, you know, you might be on Zoom, but you're, uh, you're, you uh, you know, getting the same experience. Yeah, Vikan is commenting, I'm hoping the hospitality budgets don't get cut again, which is kind of what I'm getting at that, you know, I hope that this helps to remind everybody that, you know, even even under these circumstances, it's still it's still really important. Um, I'm, I'm looking, I have everybody. Well, I, I think you're, I think you've hit on a good, sorry. Red. No, I was just going to say, uh, on that point, I, I think, um, we have often in the past, especially during uh, cyclical, you know, down downturns and and when there's been um, uh, cutting exercises and, and budget restraint, um, I think uh, the Foreign Service and, and our department um, in particular has, has had um, has a, has had a challenge in explaining and rationalizing and and and, and um, putting a value on some of the things that we do um, to create relationships. Uh, you know, we, we try and, um, and come up with, with metrics to, to measure uh, the results of diplomacy. Um, but if half of the efforts of diplomacy is to create the relationship so that when the crap hits the fan and you need the relationship to, to deliver an outcome, You've you've put in the investment and created the relationship. Um, it's hard to it's hard to 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 put a metric on that. Um, but I think uh, um, I think this year has certainly shown uh, shown us that um, uh, that you need to make an effort to connect to people because if you don't, uh, then when you need them, you you're not sure they're there for you anymore. I mean, I often use the the analogy that diplomacy it's like gardening right? Like that, you know, you cannot water your garden. If you miss watering your garden one or two days or even one or two weeks, probably will be okay, you know? But if you never water your garden, after a while, there's not going to be anything there. And if you only think about your garden when you want to go in there and get a tomato, you know, you might you might find a wild one from a previous uh, previous gardener who did a good job planting, but you you're not going to have that consistency, and it's it's hard to measure that, and it's hard to be yeah. disciplined with that. I noticed that the other place I, in your list of postings that I that I didn't mention, largely because I wrote it down my, and I couldn't read my own handwriting, so I was like, what was that last place? And that last place before Reykjavik was Kabul, right? Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, one of the things that I've found for myself is that my postings in Afghanistan, in some ways, have really helped me in lockdown, in the sense of, you know, you learn when you can't get out all the time, you 
you learn to find other ways of doing things, right? You're, you know, you're in a compound, you can't move around, maybe other people can't come to you. Have you found that, that, that you've drawn on those skills from being in, in that kind of hardship situation? Well, certainly, um, uh, certainly, you know, finding, finding ways to structure your time so that you, because one of the things, uh, you know, when you're in a, I think when you're in a hardship, uh, posting, or if you're, um, uh, if you are, um, in a place where, uh, your movements are restricted or, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very easy, I think, uh, as, uh, many of us are kind of type A, uh, dedicated to the foreign service, really interested in what we do. It's very easy to fall back on workaholism. Uh, you know, if you can't, if you can't go out and see anybody, if you can't uh, do anything, may as well get more work done. Um, you know, I remember, I remember thinking, uh, when I was going to Afghanistan and thinking, thinking, you know, feeling guilty about it uh, in a way that this was going to be a great year because I wouldn't have to feel guilty about work-life balance. I wouldn't have to feel guilty about not spending time with my partner because I could, you know, I could um, uh, feed the inner uh, workaholic uh, without guilt. Uh, but in the end, it just it just wears you down. Uh, you lose creativity. You actually then, in 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 that environment, I needed uh, I needed to find even more structure. So yes, we were working longer hours, but I needed to schedule when I was going to go to gym in, to the gym in the afternoon before going to the dining hall before going back to the, the office for three more hours in the evening, um, because because that was what gave me the refreshed you know, mind space to be able to do it. And I think some of those things are happening now during uh, the pandemic too. Um, you know, for a long time, I was just, uh, you know, one of the, thing, one of the things I think we, we failed uh, as an organization, I think probably as a society, uh, at least the sort of white collar professional society um, that has been working from home is that nobody ever stopped after our first month of being in crisis mode last year, nobody ever stopped and said, whoa, this is going to be a long time. We need to actually, like we're not teleworking. Someone has said in the meeting uh, I was in, I thought it was brilliant. We are not teleworking. Stop talking about us teleworking. We are surviving a pandemic and trying to do some work off the side of our desks yeah. while we're taking care of family and, and trying to you know, survive this thing. So what we didn't do was stop and say, okay, how are we gonna telework healthily? What is going to be the parameters? Like when you leave the office and you put your office phone on, uh, you know, to, on voicemail and you get in your car and you commute or on transit or on your bike and you come home, A, you've got, you've got 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever of, of headspace where you're not doing another email. That's, that's a healthy thing. But you're also um, creating a distance. Um, and when the distance is, you know, I open the door of my, this, this spare room and go down to, you know, half a half, half a stair stairwell of steps and I'm at the fridge that's not healthy you know that, that's not that's not a that's not a commute um it's the bad uh, part of food during the during the pandemic yes yeah so but 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 yeah creating some some um structure where uh you know this has been the year oddly enough um I am not a morning person uh I have I've struggled with figuring out how I'm going to put exercise in my uh in my routine um but I decided, oh, well, I'm actually at home. I don't have to commute. I'm going to get on the exercise bike every morning. And it's just going to be part of the routine. And I'll do it before, before the day gets crazy. Uh, and then we'll do an, uh, an afternoon walk, even if that's scheduled in between meetings or calls. But there will be an afternoon walk when the sun is nicest and when we can get outside and, uh, and enjoy it um, and not wait until after dinner. Yeah, um, no, it's true. I mean, it, I think it really helps if you're if you're lucky enough to be in a big enough place where you can have a dedicated office too, you know, and you can have different spaces for different activities in your in your day. Sure. But it's hard. Um, Leanne had her hand up, and so I promoted her to a panelist so that she hey, can Leanne. be visible and and uh, and talk. So hi, Leanne. <laughs> oh, sorry, you're, you're muted. Mute. There's always got to be someone who <laughs> forgets. I'll talk about at least one. I do it once a day. It's going to say you look fit and trim there, Stuart. So uh, all that walking's paying off <laughs> for you. Um, thanks very much for sharing your ideas. And I think you guys are doing some really creative things. Um, 
with all this virtual stuff, do you see then the need for us as diplomats to be in country? Um, you know, because you can now set up virtual meetings with the rectors and the business people and all of that, what's the value of, I know there's value, like it's not me, I'm being the devil's advocate. You know, do you think there'll be a move towards maybe not having as many of us? I think it's a, a a really important question, and I think it's going to be an existential one that we that we are are going to face. Uh, you know, I mean, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, with our experience in 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 just in the last thirty years of government. Um, you know, we've had to go through tough times of finding cuts and, and cutbacks, and that was when a government was only trying to reduce. $20 billion out of a deficit. Um, we're going to be, uh, you know, the, the, pe the pandemic deficit uh, spending, you know, is up to $400 billion or whatever it is. Now that's not core funding that programs that go on forever. And therefore we have to find $400 billion in cuts, but, but eventually there's going to be need to be a tightening, um, you know, to try and get us back towards, uh, towards some budget sanity. Um, and, and so it's hard to imagine that there won't be a lot of real questioning. And when, um, when we have this year all stepped up and proven that we can be productive, and in, in fact, in some ways, be more productive uh, when, we're, when we're at home or partly at home, um, I can't imagine that there aren't people at Treasury Board thinking, hmm, does global affairs really need five buildings? Does global affairs really need that many office space? You know, um, but uh, but I think what what our big challenge is going to be is 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 somehow communicating, boiling down what you just hit on the 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 fact that we still need to be out in the field. Um, and, and part of that is is the relationship building I talked about before, because I don't think you can do that cold call from from away. And I don't think you can do it virtually uh, all the time anyway, even even if, you know, people are helping you with virtual networking and introduce introductions and things like that. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think uh, virtual diplomacy has also shown us um, uh, the weaknesses of, of itself, uh, of it as a model, it doesn't work well, uh, for the initial uh, relationship building. It doesn't work well, I'm told, by some of our colleagues in multilateral. Um, uh, there's some things uh, that can happen multi, you know, mul the, the idea that a multilateral process, a summit process, you know, would involve hundreds of people coming together every month uh, for a meeting internationally and, and, you know, with that carbon footprint and that, uh, that travel expense, etc. Perhaps that, that doesn't need to happen in the same way. Except when you're in the last stretch before a, a, a leader summit or a minister summit, and you really need to crack heads in a room and 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 stare across a table, you know, eyeball to eyeball, and say, "Listen, we have to compromise. We have to get this done because the ministers are coming next month or whatever." It, when you're behind a virtual distance, it's easy to fall back on your national statement and say, "Well, I think we should look at this in in the in the interstitial time, and we should we should come back, and we should perhaps others could could, could provide some you know uh, some some uh, other alternatives or, you know, no, this is our position. What's your, you know, how, what, how do you want me to fix this? Um, it's easy to kind of bat the ball back into uh, the other side's court and then, and then step back because you don't have to stay in the room until you've got an agreement or you don't have to eat dinner with those people tonight, or you don't have to, you know, so, so um, I would, I would hazard to say that we, 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 we could find um, some examples where, uh, where achieving um, international consensus on stuff has been more complicated because of the lack of being able to get together. Um, I can tell you, uh, our, our leaders, ministers and, uh, and the prime minister and, and others are keen uh, to travel again. Uh, I think they uh, feel that the, that the, the connection uh, in virtual events uh, isn't, uh, isn't uh, the quality of, uh, of connection you get in an uh, in-person meeting. Um, uh, I think, I think, unfortunately, so, so I think there will always be a role for us to be in the field. Uh, you know, even just, um, even just the, the question of, of, of time zones, uh, you know, uh, you're being able to connect with business people or leaders uh, in Germany, um, you know, yes, if we got rid of all of our network in Germany, we could try and do that virtually from here, but 
what kind of quality of life is that for the people here trying to do that overnight? Because really, it's you got to yeah. do it when the people are awake and doing stuff in the in the country you want to you want to engage. Um, but uh, but I I think the uh, another big challenge is going to be that when we move back to in person, um, the ministers uh, and and senior people um, yes they're going to they're going to get back on planes they're going to travel again we're going to be hosting events um, and maybe because of budgets uh, you know we're we're uh, and just people's time availability we're going to go back to a rhythm where uh, you know the minister is really only able to do that kind of engagement once a month uh, or you know once every six weeks or something depending on parliamentary schedules and stuff but they have learned now that in between those international mm -hmm. travels they could do they could convene they can attend all sorts of other international ones that before they had to actually exercise some judgment and some discipline and say no that doesn't meet my priorities that's not the top two prior we're only going to do two two visits this month so we're going to go to germany and while we're over there we're going to we're going to you know stop down in spain and, and do this other thing that we wanted to do for a while um they're now going to say That'll be my one trip this month. But in between, in the other weeks, I'd like to do some engagement in Asia, Asia some engagement in Latin America. I want to do that other thing with the UK mm -hmm. that was kind of second priority. But, you know, so all of a sudden, moving back to normal is actually going to increase the pace uh, of diplomacy. Um, and, and, and don't get me started on where are we going to find the money to pay for all of that. Um, uh, and I will withhold my comments on the uh on the uh government's attempt to to sh save make make savings uh, on our travel budgets in the in the, the recent budget which of course is a laudable goal um but of course that almost presupposes that the virtual that replaces the travel is cost free and i can tell you managing two teams that have done 600 events over the last year it's not cost free there's a whole bunch of people that have been doing just that because they weren't doing the in-person stuff. And by the end of this year, we're going to be doing the in-person stuff again. So where does the team come from that's going to do all the virtual stuff? So you think that that's, that's what, how it's going to play out, that we're going to add, we're going to expand to all this virtual stuff on top of our regular oh, yeah. in-person in -person stuff? I can see yeah. that from from Paso as well. Thanks, Leanne. <laughs> but but I can see I can see that from Paso as well. I mean, I don't think we're going to go back to doing um, these breakfasts in person, except maybe once a quarter, you know, something yeah. like that, like just to have have a chance for everybody to to get together. But it's great. Well, I mean, one one got... of the great things one of the great things you're doing is that you're reaching well beyond what would have been an HQ focused or national capital region focused event. Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, the champion for LGBTQ, and we did uh, an event last year for Trans Day of Remembrance. And you know, the year before, we did it in person in the Cadio Auditorium, and we advertised it, and we re reached out to diplomats in Ottawa and other departments. We got 25 people in the in the Cadio Auditorium, which kind of loses it, you know, as, as, because it's only 25 people, the big huge auditorium. This year or last fall, we did it. Um, we were able to have panelists that came from all across the, the country. Um, and we had 150 people from all around the world who stayed on for the entire 90 minutes of the event. Um, yeah. So virtual can extend your reach. Oh, for sure. I mean, we've got people here. I see we've got somebody from Islamabad. We've got, you know, uh, Leanne. We've got um, somebody from Washington. I mean, we've got a lot of, of, of participation that was not possible before. And more people because, you you know, you don't have to you know make your way to the building and you know be vertical necessarily i mean people could be listening from bed hey i see we have a question from from pamela bose who's asking uh, what's going to happen to the handshake <laughs> as a protocol officer uh, uh, what are we going to what are we going to do about the handshake for in our future well i think that's a good question pam um uh the the um the handshake. Uh, I'll tell you one funny story. When when the when the when the pandemic was just starting and people were inventing these new ones, the you know the elbow, the fist, the even the ankle. There were some Europeans that were like basically kick, kicking each other in the ankle. Um, but uh, I remember being at one of the last diplomatic receptions I went to, uh, and everybody was experimenting with these different things. You know, um, but it was hilarious because 
we were all trying to be creative and funny about this this new pandemic thing that was that was kind of emerging. We were all standing in a room with 100 people, of course, yeah. um, and we were trying to stay a few feet away from each other. But meanwhile, we had all just come through a receiving line, and every one of us had shaken the hands of everybody from that embassy's host committee. Um, so, so breaking those tra those those traditions is is going to be difficult. Um, but uh, but I think uh, you know there there are enough really interesting cultural other models, whether it's the namaste, whether it's the hand on the heart, whether it's, like one, uh, yeah. you know, a bow. Uh, I think, uh, I think in some ways, uh, those are very respectful, you know, they, they lend themselves well to a protocol environment. I mean, why, why have we used the Eurocentric North American, you know, handshake as the, uh, as the, the model that we go to. Um, there are lots of others, other models. So I think it, uh, it is a chance for us to be, uh, to be creative. And Caroline is saying that in Washington, they're using the elbow, elbow bump. I, I still see lots of people doing that even in, in official photos. Um, although sometimes it's hard to tell Mr. Uh, Minister Garneau was in, in London and Dominic Rabb was trying to do the elbow thing with them. And it was a photo op and, but they <laughs> were trying to walk into a building. And so we do also have to figure out how to script this so that it makes it, makes it, uh, makes it seem dignified. Be more, yeah, more elegant. No, it's true. But you know, one great thing this winter, I normally get at least a couple colds, and I didn't get any this winter. You it's know? surprising how, how how healthy people can be if you just wash works. your hands and don't breathe on people. Which we should all be have been doing forever and never were. But I don't know. I mean, I've kind of gone a bit feral. I think now that I know that we're all breathing in like each other's, you know. Everything. The idea of being in big rooms, it's just kind of, it's going to take some, some, some getting used to, I think. Stuart, yeah. I'm conscious, I know you have to go to ops, right? So I, I, uh, I know we're at five to five to nine. So maybe I'll make one last call for anybody who, uh, who has, oh, I see Claudia has a, has a question. So I'm going to, Claudia, I'm going to promote you to a panelist. There we are. I like to have this power of promotion for people. So, Claudio, go go ahead. Oh, and you've got that Thanks. witness protection look there. Ah, there, there we are. Actually, you can see me now. Thanks yes. so much, Stuart, for, for bringing us into your world. And uh, I have a quick comment and a question. Um, one is about the ambassadors that you interact with and their value. Um, it's a little ironic that I'm in Bogota and their man in Ottawa is my go-to guy when I want to get yeah. things done. And, and these ambassadors can be extremely effective for us. And I'm assuming that everybody's doing that, but I wonder if, if you see that, if you have any visibility on that and any comment on that. And, and the question is um, about you know, COVID and, and, and uh, confinements and flight restrictions and how that has challenged us to conduct diplomacy. And I think that when you're posted to Canada, this must be especially frustrating because in some countries, all the action happens in the capital. But Canada is so extensive that not being able to really travel across the country, and many of these ambassadors don't have the benefit of having consulates in Vancouver or in Toronto or in Montreal. So uh, what are the things that you hear when you meet with them, when you do your bicycle diplomacy, uh, you know, without revealing, of course, any state secrets, but how do they perceive Canada? What have you learned uh, and fr from, from all of that interaction with them? Thanks, Claudio. Um, um, and I'll try and be be quick uh, on the first question about Ambassadors Connect being being a good uh, kind of uh, point of contact. Absolutely, uh, I actually hear it more and more. Um, uh, certainly, when I was uh, in Iceland, one of my most important phone calls every month was to my counterpart in Ottawa, um, and it wasn't to find out what was going on in Ottawa. It was to have him help me navigate his system back in in, in Reykjavik, uh, and he would have questions for me about. Uh, who's the best person for him to talk to in Ottawa about these things. And often it's because you're in the same headspace. You're both working on the same kind of thing. So you're trying to figure that stuff out together. And the idea that the two embassies then becomes sort of, kind of part of the same team is, is, is a, I think it's a, a creative kind of way. And I, I think it's, it was happening before the pandemic. It's probably happening a little bit more now. I certainly see uh, and hear uh, about, uh, about a lot of, uh, of ambassadors connecting. Um, on the um, uh, what I'm hearing from from uh, ambassadors in, in terms of, uh, of of being stuck in Ottawa and not being uh, able to travel the country, um, some of them, as you say, are, are, are very fortunate, have lots of 
consulates across the country and, and, and are very active. Um, uh, one of the things that we do uh, in, in the normal times is we organize uh, once a year in partnership with a different province's Office of Protocol, what we call an economic mission, where um, uh, ambassadors all go like we did two years ago, the last one in, in person was in BC and 53 uh, ambassadors from from Ottawa, well, I guess it was 35 and then 20 consuls from Vancouver all came together for three days in Vancouver uh, and Victoria and on the island and up the coast and uh, and the government there put on a whole program for us that we collaborated with them to, to go out and meet leaders and get to know. And that was good for the small embassies that don't have uh, embassy, uh, consulates to, to reach out this year um, uh, because we're all stuck here um, we decided to move online so we did it with Alberta uh, and we've had four uh, economic mission sessions with the province of Alberta uh, online uh, and uh, and in fact uh, they were hugely popular um, and instead of getting 20 30 40 50 we got 120 uh, you know ambassadors or charges at every one of them and that's for like a two hour or three hour session where there's a there's a presentation and there's like a really rich q a and because because i think they they, they recognize they too want to get back to kind of the regular engagement business. Um, and I think they, they, they do find it hard uh, to reach out to a province they've never visited or to business communities they've never visited. Um, and, and so I've also been encouraging chiefs of protocol uh, in the provinces and they've started organizing kind of virtual visits. So you'll see, you know, the Consul General of uh, France in Toronto, who also covers Manitoba, doing a virtual visit to Manitoba that, you know, is a series of, uh, of virtual meetings that they kind of brand and do some tweeting around and they have some interaction and photo ops with, uh, with business leaders and um, which, which helps them uh, make some connections, uh, you know, start talking about a partnership um, uh, agenda. And, uh, but people, I mean, they're, they're using uh, online, but they're all very eager to start traveling again, that's for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart. And thanks, Claudia. I know Stuart and I, we talked about I gotta run. Like, doing something with the DIPCOR here and, I know, having people engage with, with PASO members. So we'll, we can talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit more. I think we'll, we'll get your team, your expert team to help us, uh, <laughs> help us figure out what will, what will work, but thank you so much. And thank you everybody. I'm going to stop the recording now.